So for having a, a, for the first uh, presentation is by Stephanie Collins and Holly uh, Lofer. This is Holly, Stephanie, and uh, Holly is going to present and both of them will take questions. Great, thank you. Cool, so as you see we're talking about collectives and individuals' obligations and we're going to try to make an argument in favour of parity between the two. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the motivation for the paper you know, at all, existing at all. Um, so one thing that we noticed in the literatures was that there's a lot of discussion about um, the conditions under which groups count as being the right kind of thing to bear obligations, the sort of capacity conditions. Um, and then there's a lot of discussion about specific cases in which particular groups bear particular obligations. Um, so, for example, discussions about a particular obligation borne by a company, so BP having obligations to clean up after the oil spill and so on. So there's a general discussion about whether collectives can be the kinds of things to bear obligations in specific discussion, but no sort of general treatment, at least as far as we could find, of the way that obligations might be thought to work for collectives, which sets up this question. Um, do they work in roughly the same way? Uh, for collectives as they would work for individuals or not. Um, so why isn't the answer just perfectly obvious? I guess that's the thing to get out of the way first. So you might think um, moral obligations bear on moral agents, uh, at least some kinds of groups, groups organised in a particular way according to particular conditions, um, count as moral agents, uh, and therefore some moral obligations bear on some collectives. Whichever are organised in the right way. So I don't just think that the answer is extremely straightforward. Um, and then the question wouldn't be, you know, how do obligations work for collectives um, or in what way, but it would just be who counts. So we just would want to know what are the right conditions, who gets in, what kinds of groups get in as counting, and then we just apply all the same moral apparatus that we've been used to apply. Um, the reason that we think it's not completely obvious and therefore warrants some discussion uh, is that there's a few reasons to think that there would be disparity between the two. Um, the first reason, I guess, is that individuals set up collectives in order to pursue certain of their ends together. So it's a sort of voluntarist um, thing where people get together, they establish groups, sports teams, churches, maybe even governments and so on, to pursue their ends. Um, and then it looks like there should be a lot of latitude in terms of what those groups are allowed to do. So maybe there's certain constraints. Pursue your ends without doing a lot of harm along the way. But certainly to think there's a full complement of moral obligations of the same sort that individuals have, looks like it would be really demanding and constrain those um, ends that, that um, the groups have. So that looks like a reason to think there would be a difference between the two. Um, so Peter Singer actually says something like this about art galleries. Here's this new book, um, The Most Good We Could Do, something like this. Uh, and he says, uh, of, of art galleries and duties of assistance, uh, they were set up for a different purpose and to use their funds to help the global poor would presumably be a breach of their founding deeds or statutory obligations and could invite litigation to ask donors who may perceive it as a violation of the purposes for which they had donated. Right, so this sort of line, like, that is not what the art gallery is for. So having duties of assistance looks weird in this kind of case. Um, and then the second worry is sort of to do with double counting or people being hit twice by obligations. The thought is, collectives are made out of individuals. Individuals already bear this full complement of moral obligations. And now if you want to apply them again at the level of the collective, it looks like it's going to be really unfair and in some sense overgenerate the amount of obligations that there are. So people are going to be hit in virtue of being individuals and then hit again in virtue of membership. So those are the reasons to think that there would be some disparity um, and then to sort of motivate the need for a discussion. Okay, so what are the research questions? Um, the main one is do collectives have obligations from the same sources as individuals? So we're not talking about specific obligations but rather the kinds of obligations. Um, from the, these kinds of sources. In this list, we won't get through all of them we do in the paper, but here we'll just mention a few. So it's a kind of paradigmatic list of the sources of obligations we think individuals have. Um, so not exhaustive, don't start thinking of counterexamples, um, but sort of paradigmatic of the main kinds of sources that get discussed. Um, I've been warned about this. Philosophers are counterexample generating machines, so you have to always make sure not to accept the challenge up that way. <laughs> 
Um, good. And then the second question, which is not one about sort of breadth or scope, is about um, the relation to the all things considered. So whether collectives' obligations are going to plug in in the same way to what the collective all things considered ought to do, in the same way that that works for individuals. So the sort of relation between the potento obligations and the all things considered obligations, and whether there's some special difficulty there. So ultimately the question is, is there parity, or even it would still be interesting, is there near parity between collectives and individuals' obligations? Okay, good. And then just a quick caveat before we go into the substance. Um, we're just assuming that some groups will meet the conditions that make them capable of bearing obligations. So it's a non-skeptical starting position. And we take as paradigmatic kinds of groups that meet those conditions. And we have a story about our preferred conditions, but you can bring your own favourite one along. We, we can be neutral here between which is the right one. Um, for us, the paradigmatic kinds of groups that will meet the conditions are things like um, corporations, companies, churches, international organisations and governments. So these are the kinds of groups we have in mind, but you can put in whatever you like. Whatever kinds of groups would meet the conditions, then we're talking about obligations for those kinds of groups. Okay. focus on what we think are the hardest or the most interesting challenges, right? So if you don't work through it, we'll just say a few things um, about a few of these. So I'll make a comment on benefiting, um, on promising and rectifying, which we'll take together, um, and on association. And so uh, that's just because we think some of these are more or less straightforward. So most people tend to agree that there's some sort of prohibition on harming the way that a corporation can pursue its end. There'll be side constraints on how that can go. Um, it's more complicated to talk about joint harming, of course. Single authored harming seems um, relatively obvious, so that's not, that's not a particularly challenging case. And likewise for assistance, although it might seem so, actually the main challenges that come up with duties of assistance for collectives come up when, it's, um, when we talk about demanding it and priority. So there's a challenge there in thinking about how demanding they might be able to be, but there's no particular challenge in thinking about whether they have them at all. So we're just going to set those aside here and kind of assume that. Fine, and the remaining um, categories are what I'll comment on. Okay. So, uh, I'll start with benefiting. I'll actually go to the promising and rectificatory obligations next because I think they have a common challenge. And then I'll finish with association. Um, to really give a full treatment, of course, of any of these categories, I'd have to convince you of like, the right theory of why there are obligations in those categories, and then we'd have to talk in particular about the details. So there are a lot of competing accounts of you know, why it is that there are obligations not to benefit from injustice or harm. or right. So it's going to depend, for most of what I say, it will depend a bit on the account, likewise promising association and so on. Um, but I think what we say about benefiting, at least, is neutral between quite a few of the accounts. Um, in the paper, what we do is run a few thought experiments or cases. Um, so consider a case like uh, um, a ca one cafe being vandalised, and then the customers of that cafe ending up you know, um, giving their patronage for the next week or so to the cafe down the road. Um, and now, it looks like... Uh, most people, at least in conferences that I've been at where these kinds of cases get discussed, have the intuition that there would be no duties not to benefit from injustice in those kinds of cases. So uh, companies in a kind of market context would not have obligations not to benefit from injustice, even though so we, would ca we would categorize the vandalism as an injustice. We would agree that there's these sort of downstream effects, but we wouldn't think that the um, other company needed to give up the benefits in the way that we usually do in the individual case. 
Um, so that looks like a, a sort of prima facie reason to think that the two come apart. Here we have strong intuitions about collectives not having these kinds of obligations and individuals having them. And actually what we do in the paper is try to make a diagnosis in terms of the market context being special. So it looks like the thing that's doing the distorting of whether there are um, obligations not to benefit is the market context. And in fact, we suggest that if we ran the same case with individuals, so just the individual you know, selling flowers or home-roasted coffee beans at a market, one sort of gets disrupted in the, a similar way, the customers end up going to the other one, we likewise wouldn't have the intuitions um, that the second had to you know, disgorge their benefits to the first or whatever else. So we think there's a common distorting factor, which is the market context, but there's no inference or difference based on the fact of being a collective versus being an individual. Okay. Um, so promissory and rectificatory obligations. So obligations that arise from making promises, entering into agreements, contracting into specific duties, um, and to rectify the violations of obligations. These meet a common challenge when it comes to thinking about collectives um, for reasons to do with continuity over time. So it looks like um, it's kind of easy in the case of individuals. Um, I mean, we don't usually get that much into the metaphysics, but you can think about it in a sort of time slicey way, um, like time slice holly, t minus five made a promise, and now like T, what is it now, zero, Holly, has an obligation to keep minus five's promise, right? So you, you can think about your, your worm um, in this way. And the, the problem with collectives, I guess, is that there seem to be a lot of ruptures in the continuity, right? So there's three different ways that there can be um, ruptures for collectives, um, and which then seem to test the intuitions about whether collectives can have these sorts of obligations to keep their promises, keep their contracts and agreements, um, rectify violations. And the rupture is to do with really thinking about whether it's the same agent or not. So collectives can dissolve, a corporation can declare bankruptcy and then disband. Um, they can divide, so when parts of, for example, a unified state end up succeeding into two, so um, as was recently threatened in the Scottish independence movement, um, and they can unite, so two charities can decide they'll be better off if they amalgamate into one super charity. So we have all these movements in which collectives can sort of end, come together, um, uh, uh, come apart, and that looks like it's going to change the nature of their obligations, because once they've changed those ways, they surely don't have the right sort of continuity with, their, with the person who made the, with the thing or the agent that made the promise, entered the agreement, made the contract, did the violation in order to, to rectify it. Um, so the suggestion is that the kinds of obligations they had prior to this rupture, let's just call it a rupture, um, won't carry over. And then, again, what we do in the paper is just suggest, um, even if this is a more frequent problem for collectives, it doesn't look like it's a problem unique to collectives that will uniquely affect collectives' obligations. Uh, all of those things can also apply in the case of individuals. Of course, individuals can dissolve, which just means they die, right? You make a promise and then you die. Um, uh, it's a bit hard to understand how they can divide. I guess they don't divide in roughly the same way, but there's all sorts of ruptures to psychological continuity, extreme dementia, extreme mental illnesses, um, and so on. So becoming schizophrenic. So you might think there's a certain uh, severeness of cognitive disorder which makes a rupture in personal identity. Um, and also we were trying to think of cases of something like fusion for individuals. There's a kind of healthy case where people fall creepily in love and become like mutually in interdependent to just like an alarming degree. So you might think that's a sort of fusion case. Um, and then the less, the less healthy cases, right, so things like cults, um, um, brainwashing, and, uh, and things like that. So they're healthy and they're unhealthy version. Or maybe they're both quite unhealthy, but we don't get into that here. What's that? Both healthy. Both, <laughs> yeah, both healthy. Similar. Um, good. So it looks like um, this is not a problem that's unique to collectives or uniquely affects collectors' obligations. It looks like the kind of problem that affects both individuals and collectors just might be a little more frequent in collectors because it's more frequent, for example, for states to um, uh, divide or unite. 
And also there's a problem of visibility. In individuals, it's just way less visible, whereas in collectives, you can see it. If an individual suffers a permanent rupture psychologically with their previous self, they still have all the same packaging. Right? So it's just harder to see that there's been this kind of rupture that might affect responsibility over time. It doesn't mean it's not there, it just means it's harder to see. Okay, so again, that's the sort of thought why actually that challenge can be met. There is still symmetry between both. Okay, and then the final thing we wanted to comment on was association. Mm. Again, sort of just like I mentioned with benefiting, that's going to depend a lot on which specific account you want to um, plug in and then talk about. But so we just worked through um, Sheffler's account, which is pretty well known in the paper. Um, and on that account, we have associative duties as a result of relationships that we have non-instrumental reason to value. Um, so the primary difficulty for parity there, for, for thinking that collectives, just like individuals, can have these associative obligations... Um, is thinking about whether collectives can have these relationships that are intrinsically valuable. Um, and again, I mean, this is maybe just our intuitions, but we kind of think they can, right? So they might have less. It might turn out that it's often the case for corporations or companies that they tend to have instrumental relationships and so therefore wouldn't have associative obligations because they wouldn't have relationships of the right kind. We think at least... Um, uh, there's at least two kinds of relations that we think would meet the conditions for non-instrumental value. One is the sort of relationship that states tend to have with their citizens, so the kind of relationship between states and members, and that might hold for other kinds of um, collective agents as well. And then we were thinking also of um, certain sorts of relationships between states. This might be naive coming from two New Zealanders, but actually in the paper we talk about the relationship between Australia and New Zealand. So shared history of colonial injustice, shared kind of very similar culture, common language, reciprocal um, trade and immigration agreements, and so on and so forth. This sort of affectionate, snipey fondness, um, and we thought maybe that generates something like the right conditions for relationships that the states have not an instrumental reason to value. Okay, so again, um, we think maybe there's going to be a, a question of frequency, so because more of the relationships are instrumental, there'll be less such obligations, but still we think there's no... Um, uh, no problem in principle for the parity account. Great, so that's all I'm going to say about the breadth issue. Um, as I mentioned, we're leaving some things aside. Um, and then I just want to make a quick comment in the remaining 2.5 minutes um, about string. So say something quickly about demandingness and something quickly about priority. Okay, so as I mentioned already, the um, strength issue is sort of about how the potential obligations relate to the all things considered obligation and whether that works in roughly the same way as it works for individuals. Mm. I mentioned already, sort of in uh, setting things up in the motivation part, about what the demandingness worry is. Um, that pulls us in one direction. So the thought was um, individuals establish collectives together to pursue particular ends. Um, and then, given that, it looks like the demandingness threshold on what they can be required to do, or what it would be reasonable to ask of them, should be fairly low. Right? So some side constraints, maybe don't do heaps of harm along the way in pursuing your ends. Um, but otherwise, you have a lot of latitude to kind of accomplish the things that your members have set you up to do. So, um, so that seems like... A, in principle, reason to think that the demanding this threshold should, should be set quite low, and probably lower than it is for individuals who we think have this full complement of moral obligations. Then there's a reason that pulls us in the opposite direction, which is to do with phenomenal experience. So you might think, what is it about demanding this that makes it um, a legitimate concern for individuals? Well, it's that it kind of things feel extremely demanding, and this has some sort of negative consequence. It feels far too burdensome to me on my life plans to ask a lot of me in terms of extreme amounts of assistance and so on. And there's a sense in which groups just don't have that problem. If they don't feel demands in the same way, maybe we can ask way more of them. So it just looks like there's two reasons to think demanding this pull in different directions, but whichever one you find more convincing, or maybe both, it's pulling in a different direction from how we think about demanding this for individuals. Um, so 
So again, we kind of agree about how demandingness works. So we think that it should be sensitive to conflict with a person's constitutive ends or a group agent's constitutive ends. Um, uh, and we think it should be sensitive to the extent to which a demand is felt as extremely demanding, uh, although maybe with some caveats, right? So like, like reasonably felt as demanding, so not just the miser and how they feel about giving two pounds to charity, um, two euros, sorry. Um, but then we don't think that's a, a serious difference from the individual case either because individuals have constitutive ends to which um, um, their obligations can uh, can add tension or can conflict. So a life worth living, for example, or a life full of meaningful experiences. So again, we just think demandingness is going to relate in a similar kind of way um, in the case of individuals as it does uh, to the case of collectives. And we also think that members of groups can feel distributed demands. And so that's a way of making sense of the idea that groups can feel demands as well. Okay. I'm 45 seconds over, so now I rush very quickly, taking one minute of the question time and comment on priority, and then we're done. Um, so the priority issue is just about um, when an individual has obligations qua individual, so I made a promise to my friend to meet him for lunch, and then obligations qua member of a group, there's something that I have to do in virtue of my membership in the state, and these to come into conflict. The worry is, if individuals' obligations qua individuals always have priority, it might be that they always end up crowding out obligations qua member of a group, and then collectives will never have the ability to fulfill their obligations because uh, individuals have always kind of maxed out what's required of them just in their role as individuals. So the thought would be this kind of way of affecting collective ability. If I always do what I have to do as an individual and that maxes out my budget, there's just nothing left over. Um, and again, the way we respond to that is to just say there's no reason to think that my obligations qua individual should always have priority. There's just going to be a question about what the ends are at stake. And sometimes the collective's ends are going to be more morally important than my ends qua individual. So meeting my friend for lunch, keeping my promise. And in that case, it looks like I as an individual should prioritise the obligations I have in virtue of my membership in the group. So it's, just, it's going to be completely resolved by what it is that's at stake. And that problem is only really there if we think that individuals' obligations qua individual always have priority, which we don't think. Okay, we'll stop there. So, uh, questions? And again, identify yourself, please. Yeah. I'm uh, Saba Bazargan from UC San Diego. Hi, Saba. Hi. Uh, what <laughs> okay, oh yeah, no, I remember the, um, So about the double counting worry, I mean, there might be a different sort of more basic reason to think that it isn't a worry uh, if you just look at the sort of role-based, professional role-based ethics. So, uh, you know, you have surgeons or, or, or firefighters or police officers, they have special duties in virtue of the roles that they have, and these duties often increase because they have these roles. So, for example, the duties of beneficence or aid might be greater for a police officer or for a surgeon than it would be for someone who doesn't occupy these roles. We don't, we don't generally think of that as double counting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there still issues here, but, but it is an issue of double counting. I mean, maybe it's the same thing for individuals who are members of collectives, that uh, they have increased duties of aid partly in virtue of occupying this role, mm -hmm. and it's no more problematic than saying that the, a surgeon or a police officer or a firefighter combatant has increased duties. And maybe that's one way to go. That's all. Good. Um, would you just take a uh, Do you want to Yeah, you can start out. Um, so I guess the... So, <laughs> so the, um, this is, I think that's, that's just great and helpful, but maybe just to give you more ammo, the paradigm case that we had in mind was something like collecting in the case of a natural disaster, and then the thought was, if every individual already had given, say, 20 pounds, 20 euro, 20 euro, and then the group of which they'd formed, you know, a sports team, a music interest group, or whatever else, was then asked to donate, 
And let's say, say the surgeon, the surgeon already gave 20 pounds, but look, there's people who are dying on the streets as a result of the earthquake. The surgeon might also have to go and be, you know, do surgery, life-saving, life-saving surgery. Is that double counting? So I think that's helpful. My worry with that is that it disincentivizes joining groups. Mm -hmm. um, because it means that people don't join groups so that they don't have to have these demanding obligations. So we would have to talk about whether we wanted to go down that route. I mean, it's possible that, yeah, in virtue of being a member in this group, my budget is just bigger when it comes to discharging any or maybe some of the duties. But I think I, I have worries about it. And in any case, it's, there's still going to be a problem, as Holly was saying, there's still going to be a problem when I've already reached, when, when I've already maxed out my budget. Those are the cases that we're interested uh -huh. in. So that question's still going to arise. But that's helpful. Yeah, oh, that's that helpful occurs though. in professional ethics as well. Yeah. 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 Philip? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is you know, a lot of fun and well worth pursuing, but there, there are really. Uh, but there are deep assimilations. <laughs> 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 I mean, there are. I sort of think, if I think in terms of the psychology of the the psychology of the collective agent or the, the, the corporate agent, right? the sort of what you're thinking of. I mean, in the case of uh, we as individuals, we have a whole subpersonal psychology, you know, we've got perceptions, we've got feelings, we've got emotions, you know, lots of things are, are as it were, um, hardwired in, you know, and on top of that, we do a lot of deliberation, we construct a persona, and we try to act up to it and so on. And when you move to the any corporate entity, it's got no sort of personal psychology. It's, it's wholly, so to speak, in the in the cortical. You know, the, you know, the, the, um, it, it's wholly the psychology of the members establishing routines, of course, which do get followed more or less routinely. But on any decision, it's a it's big deliberation sort of stuff, right? Now, I think that that. That really does make for a huge difference in the the capacities of these two sorts of agents. So, for example, the capacity for friendship. Um, I don't think it makes much sense to talk about a corporate agent being a friend. I mean, this is now going to the association one, I guess. Um, I mean, a friend is something. You, part of being a friend is uh, when when you're asked to do something or there a need, you don't deliberate about it. You don't calculate. You're not a friend if you do. You basically have a default response, which is a disposition of going and helping, you know. And that's what we've got in one else's relationships. Now, I think that, uh, I suppose, corporate entities might set up as it were algorithms of response whereby, you know, you bang, you go for a good. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I can see I've got to talk Thank myself. You. Like, <laughs> so, what would be the problem with that? <laughs> that structural, you know, um, facilitation of response and the actual emotion-laden disposition, you know, that triggers the response, in the case of the human being. Um, anyhow, that's just one. I mean, I've often thought, for example, I, do you think corporate bodies can be trustworthy? You know, to be trustworthy is, I put myself in your hands and, bang, you know, you recognize reliance and that's it. You don't even think about it. You're a really trustworthy person. Assuming the red lights are not, you know, it's within the ordinary. But you know, any corporate agent that, um, <laughs> if it's making decisions on a board, in a boardroom or in a council room or whatever it might be, in a you know works council chamber, or whatever, uh, people are all going to think, well, well, is this really in our interest? You know, as a group, we individually now as members and thinking have to think from the point of view of the good of the group. I sort of think corporate entities are constitutionally untrustworthy, you know. I mean, we've seen, it, we've seen it with churches, we've seen it with NGOs, as well as with corporations and trade unions and so on. They're terrible. On the whole, they're wholly untrustworthy. If the interest of the group is, you know, in jeopardy, they routinely, as a group, act in a way that looks to number one, looks to the interest of, of the group. I think there are protections against that, and there are exemplary bodies that escape it, but Oh, wait, that's really the, uh, that's any other question. <laughs> yeah. So one thing, so one thing is that we didn't say, because we didn't have enough time, we're really only interested in obligations to act, 
So there's oh, this whole okay. debate about obligations over attitudes and over emotions. And we kind of sidestep that. I mean, I am inclined to think a story can be told about group emotions yeah. in the case of group agents. And I'm more, more, more unsure, so we just yeah. bracket that. Um, I think it's a great but, research program. <laughs> but it'll take ages, yeah. So that's one thing is that we're only talking about actions, but then you might think even some obligations to act are obligations to act reliably, like robustly, and right. that corporations just can't do that. Can't so we robust. still need to worry about that. But then it just seems like a lot of corporations are bad, untrustworthy agents, and that's more so the case for them than it is for individuals. So it's just more likely to be true that they will fail to discharge their obligations to be trustworthy. Yeah or to keep promises or so on. That doesn't mean they don't have the obligations. It just means they're more likely to renege on them. And that's my yeah. reaction. But maybe you think, no, it means they actually just can't have the obligations in the first place. But... Can we have a workshop on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more. Uh, so don't forget to say your names. I, I think a, your Philip, name. Philip had really covered the ground I was going to, so I'll pass to someone okay. else. Uh, so, yes. <clears throat> um, Andy Altman, uh, Georgia State. Uh, I'm not basically on board with the parity program, uh, although with a qualification that reflects some of what Philip has said, because I think consciousness is basically in the skull. I don't believe this extended by business. I don't get that at all. So, uh, so I don't think that, that there can't be sort of, the, the mind isn't out there, it's in here. And, uh, but with that qualification, I'm on board with the, uh, uh, the parity project. But I, I do think you made a concession a little bit too quickly to the folks who might be skeptical, and that concerned one of the rupture cases that you mentioned. Um, so um, uh, you mentioned secession of various uh, divisions of states uh, in the context of um, uh, prior obligations that they had. And um, uh, you came very close to suggesting that the division or the secession uh, would dissolve the prior obligations. But um, that doesn't reflect my intuition, and it sure doesn't reflect in international law. So, for example, if uh, Scotland had uh, seceded from, uh, <coughs> from uh, the UK, it would still be under a whole set of legal obligations that had been uh, in for, uh, uh, enforce uh, against it previously, like obligations to obey human rights and treaties, even though it sort of didn't exist when these treaties were signed on to, it would just be sort of be assumed that this is a carryover obligation. So it seems to me that, it, that uh, um, uh, when states rupture, this doesn't necessarily dissolve the prior obligations. So in some cases it may, but in lots of cases it seems to me just a matter of course that the obligations undertaken by the previous whole state are now obligations that are owed by each of the rumped parts of the previous whole state. So I think maybe we both want to say something. I think we're probably going to say the same thing. Okay. Well, um, so I guess one thing is that it's important for us that um, if it's if it's such an extreme case of rupture that we think it just isn't the same agent, that doesn't preclude a story about responsibility. It's just that it wouldn't be a story about the culpability of the currently existing agents. It would be all this other apparatus that's been talked about throughout the conference about forward-looking responsibilities, assistance, benefiting, and so on. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, I think, even in a case of serious rupture, so we have in the paper Nazi Germany into East and West Germany and then back into Germany, and then maybe you want to model that as four different agents, maybe you want to model it as one into two into one. <laughs> if you do, the, I mean, there's really complicated things to say depending on the modeling, but you might still think you can pin culpable responsibility via complicity on individuals. Um, that's one way to go, to track, but it wouldn't be about parts. It wouldn't be to say there were always in the Nazi Germany two proper parts, which were East and West Germany, and if you intervened at the East and West point, you would have the part-wise agent. That just seems like the wrong thing to say. So if there really is a rupture sufficient to have kind of killed off the previous agent and made new ones, then we think we have to tell a different story about how the responsibility comes in. Be a different kind of responsibility. We still think it does, yeah. though. Like, it's really important that it does. It just doesn't come in culpable-wise. Yeah. Does that? Okay. Yeah, Simon. Um, yeah, I, I, this is great. I don't have any kind of problems with it. Uh, there's two... Very quick thought. I mean, 
one was often people say uh, states that belong to them individuals. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of deep disanality, but as a uh, known climate case, people often say Britain in 1840, so Britain can pick up the bill now. I noticed you're looking at disanalogies were more on the short, you know, the fusion, the separation. And, um, the second thing was I wondered does it make a difference what kind of personal identity one has? Um, so I know a lot of about personal identity, actually the mental person uses are about collectives, about nations, to capture it's not an entity that matters, it's a kind of continuity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if we just have, well there's one, well there's two ways of trying to argue for this, and you went for one way, and I thought maybe there's implicitly another way. So one way is to say every argument for obligation, and then say, look, it applies to individuals, it applies to groups too. But another way, which was kind of to respond to uh, Philip, was to think, uh, are there morally, are there disanalogies between groups and individuals? And then secondly, are they morally relevant ones? And so it's whether they're vacancy or whether they're emotion. And I think the two strategies kind of converge, because what you do when, when, we, uh, when you apply each argument is to say, well, is there some morally relevant disanalogy? But it, uh, to wrap up at the end, it might be to think, well, are there any kind of relevant disanalogies between groups and individuals uh, you know, that would spring to the mind of the reader and then think, well, I, it's just not disanalogous or it's just not morally relevant. I don't know if that's fair when it's clear, but it's just, there's a different way of looking at it, which is just to say, yeah, look at these two types of entity. Do they differ? Yeah. Do they differ in morally relevant ways? And that was strikes me as having a systematic kind of character that uh, would be helpful to supplement by the end. Mm -hmm. I see. Right, just to kind of make sure we've covered everything. So the idea is you go through these different kinds of obligations, but then there might be something else that you're missing that you would need to talk about. Yeah. Um, well, like like I think the emotion, the same when, when you're aware yeah. well, it's just not germane to the issue at hand. Yeah. I mean, it's just, can I comment on that? Yeah. Do you want to go back to the personal sure. identity? Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's just, I guess it's just support, which is to say our methodology has been to start with in, to start with individuals, then to look at the case for the various sources of obligations for individuals, and then just look at whether or not there's a reason to think that applies, what the challenges are for collectives. And of course, then that might mean we miss something on the other side. Like, if we had started with collectives, we might have thought that there's... And that, it's slightly different. Then there would be all sorts of different obligations that you might think aren't parallel. Um, so but also, you say it's not exhaustive. So you might knock out seven arguments and someone says, yep. well, actually, the key one is the eighth one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you kind of look at whether the agents... Uh the way in which no, that's good. Understand. We should do both. Yeah, we've gone. We, what we've argued is that um, collectives have all the same kinds of obligations as individuals, but that doesn't entail the reverse. So no. we would need to, yeah, we would need to wrap up. Okay, that's good, actually. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Anything else? Personal identity. Personal identity and short term, long term thing. Um, it does depend on your account of personal identity. Um, we, we, try to be we try to be neutral, so if you have this kind of, uh, it's the R relation, like the relation that matters. Um, then you can kind of plug that in as our thought and whatever your account of personal identity is, you're going to have different views on whether, say, West Germany really inherits the violations of Nazi Germany and inherits, you know, uh, uh, obligations in virtue of having violated wrongs or if they just have some other kind of obligation. Um, but we're hoping that you can just plug that in, but it would be good to know if you can't. And there are differences, right? So if you went with a physical account, you get some slightly different thing than if you went with a psychological account. Yeah, like account. if you think borders matter, like physical boundaries on people matter, then that equivalent would be lines on a map and yeah. an implausible account of personal identity, but it would just give you different results of how collective obligations work over time. But we're trying to be neutral on that. Yeah. Okay, we had one uh, last question. Somebody else has put a hand up here. A tiny bit more time. So if you're quick, uh, we can have both. So... I think I can be brief. My Just comments, watch. Chris John has from Georgetown University. My comments are in the same vein as Philip and Simon's, but maybe it's a, a suggestion. If you're talking about comparing individuals and collectors, that's a, a, a large scale project. Let me give you an analogy from the area I know about, because I don't do this kind of work, which is corporate responsibility versus individual responsibility. And in that context, when you're comparing Individual responsibility and corporate responsibility. Uh, originally, when Peter French made an argument for corporate responsibility, he called corporations moral persons. But he pulled back from that. He said, they're not moral persons, they're moral actors. So in this context, 
where would I expect to see parity? I would expect to see individuals in their, in their capacity as moral actors to be on a par with corporations in their capacity as moral actors. That's where you want the parity. But individuals have something else. They're also persons. So to the extent that individuals are persons, you would expect them to have aspects and features, rights and obligations that aren't, there's no parity for in the corporation. So what you want to do is compare at the same level, and then you'll find parity, and it will solve your problem of all these other things that seem to be associated only with individuals. Yeah, so, well, so we, diff we, we think duties, we think rights entail duties, but not vice versa. So we, this is not an argument for group rights at all. So, so when you the same for obligations, though. Moral actors have obligations, moral actors have obligations. Persons could have more obligations than moral actors. I think we don't so you see a, a disjunction. But is the, was the, what's the person's actors distinction that you're making? I'm sorry? What, can you flesh out a bit the distinction that you're making between actors and persons? Um, it's not just ha ha having obligations and having rights, is it? Yeah, if it's... If it's well, then, for instance, a person could have obligations of love. A corporation can't have obligations associated with love. I mean, there are certain characteristics of individuals okay. that give them personality that corporations don't have. What you'd expect is corporations that have the same level of obligation as human beings when they're just moral actors, and then there would be something else on top of that that's what gives them personhood. So it's the emotions, it's the emotions point that Philip was making? I think it's just, maybe we just have to think about it. It's just a distinction that we don't really make, and then we have to think about whether it's helpful for us to make this distinction between moral actors and then this further thing that's persons that might also have different obligations, or just think they're all obligations in virtue of agency or being an actor. We don't need the person thing, but then there are some disanalogies that are important. How to account for friendship. No, that's right. I think they're yeah. running to the problem. Exactly. Problems. Agreed. Thanks. So, okay. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Yvonne Campbell, and I'm just a first year PhD student. This is not my field, but uh, the observation I have is about capacity and um, whether with the agency, if it, it is a diffuse corporation where power is diffuse, as opposed to concentrated corporation, you might find that in a corporation where power is concentrated at the upper echelons, you would have greater parity with individual because the personality of that lead individual or the CEO or the head of state is in large part shaping the entity and their psychology or their emotions may well become relevant and just in case I think about this like even the very constitution of Ireland was in large part shaped by one person which was Eamon de Valera and his vision of Ireland stood the tech or was is now subject to a lot of change. And so I just would be interested in looking at kind of the different types of, of power and how, whether it's diffuse or not. But um, it may not be that relevant. No, that's, that's good. Yeah. That maybe that's just a comment. I mean, one thing to say is it's also interesting, I think, to think about how that's the same as for individuals, like individuals that are really unified in themselves and have a clear sense of um, their purpose in life and they're not particularly scatterbrained. <laughs> like, I, yeah, my temptation is always to try and see that, and, I, and I, I wonder if there's something similar there, scatterbrained people have fewer capacities and so fewer obligations. But yeah, it's good, it's something to well, we have think about. about it in the case of dictatorships for states. Yeah. So I guess there's an interesting analogy there. Yeah, actually, right. Thanks. Thanks okay, very well, much. Thank you very much. Thank you.